meaning who I am, to ask this question. This question is regarded in mysticism as one of the great questions. That the real mystery you have to prove is your own. Why knowledge matters. Professor Orvin Sharma, it's such a pleasure to finally meet you in person. Actually, it's our very second time. I have fond uh, memory uh, of the last time we met here in this office. And it's always a pleasure because it is very special talking to you in person. You're such a wise man. And when I ask you a question, when you were talking privately, it just shows me like the repertory that you have, like it's almost like walking into a library of life. That's how it feels uh, being in your office and talking to you in person. So welcome back. It's such a pleasure to finally have an episode in person. Thank you. Thank you, Yannick. And also for the kind words. I'd be happy to answer your questions. You wrote a book, Christianity for Hindus. And now, of course, this begs the questions. Why writing a book for Hindus about Christianity? There are a couple of reasons. One is a very general reason that one should encourage religious literacy. People should know about each of those religions. The reason for that is that when we do not know or have enough knowledge about other religions, then it is not the case that we have a blank state. You might imagine that because we don't know about what Islam is or Hinduism is, we have a clean slate about what they are, on which you can inscribe true knowledge. <laughs> this is usually not the case, because whenever the name of a religion is taken, a certain image of that religion forms in your mind. And if it is not based on solid facts, then that image will be colored by what you have heard about that is, what others have said about it, rather than what it is. So that is why I think we should care deeply about religious literacy. So this is one reason. The other reason is that although Hinduism is a very tolerant religion in many, especially theologically, this may have had the unfortunate effect of inhibiting one's curiosity about other religions. Yeah, yeah, we accept them. And you stop at that. What do they believe in? What do they say? So we should not allow our tolerance of other religions slide into ignorance of those religions, howsoever benign. A third reason I would urge is that because Hindus tend to believe that there can be more than one path to the divine, they imagine that all religions are like that. We often tend to believe that our view of religion is the universal view of religion. But this is not the case. All religions don't believe that there is more than one true path. And so we are at a great disadvantage when we dialogue with people of other religions. We subconsciously impose our assumptions about what a religion is or should be 
upon them. And then we shall discover in our conversation some of the differences between Hinduism and Christianity and other religions are quite deep. It does not mean that they can't be bridged, but they are quite deep. And, should there, and the difference should be recognized of what it is. These are some of the reasons within trying me to carry out the Texas. What is one of the most important differences, according to you, between Christianity and Hinduism? And what should a Hindu know especially about Christianity? I think one of the most important differences is that Christians believe that theirs is the only true faith. And from this follow a certain kind of theology, a certain kind of psychology, a certain kind of sociology, a certain kind of philosophy. So this, I think, is the single most important thing Hindus should realize about Christianity. That it regards itself as the only and we might say, when it is more accommodating, ultimately valid part of the divine. Why should especially a Hindu care in one way or another? You touched on it obviously about Christianity. Now, as you just said, it is a very specific religion when it comes to Christianity. It follows really as it says, and it's also from where certain type of scientific inquiry also comes. It's very narrow. And from that point of view, obviously, it's very different, but there are also a lot of similarities. Can you elaborate on these similarities between Christianity and Hinduism, especially for Hindus? Well, there are striking similarities. In Hinduism also, you can believe that your path is the only true path for you. For you. The real difference between Hinduism and Christianity is not just that you believe in one true religion, but that you believe that it is the one true religion for everybody. Not just for me, or not just for my community, but for the whole world. So that's where the real difference lies. So it is more individualistic in this, in that sense that Hinduism can be accommodated in, in this regard, whereas Christianity, it is closed in this sense. Well, you can put it the opposite way. You can say that Christianity is universalistic mm -hmm. because it's had its message for everyone. Mm -hmm. And Hinduism is individualistic because it says that each person can have his or her unique path. So, the proposition can also be reversed. What also struck me that at the very beginning, also from the book that you said, and you touched on this, religion has a negative connotation. But you stated it very clearly that it does much less harm to know about a religion or about religions than not. Yes, I said something about that in the beginning also that ignorance in the context of religions is not benign or neutral ignorance. For instance, there has been enough talk about terrorism mm -hmm. and of the people who practice that being often Muslims for the impression to prevail in the common mind 
that terrorism has to be associated with Islam. So when the word Islam is uttered, you would immediately think of terrorism. Or yeah, Hinduism may have been mis may have been represented, and the Hindus would think misrepresented as a religion which is, which upholds social inequality. And this impression may have become so broad based because it has not been countered that when you take the word Hindu or Hinduism, the next thought in the other person's mind would be inegalitarianism. No one has to be blamed for this in a sense, specifically. So this is what I mean by saying that ignorance is not benign ignorance in the modern world. Mm -hmm. You also said that it is in their lived expression, for example, dogma or practice in which the two mainly differ, according to you. Please elaborate further. Yeah. So this is an important point. If you want to become a Christian, what do you do? You undergo baptism of some kind, usually, which is accompanied by a creedal formulation of Christianity. Some form of Jesus is the ultimate savior or the son of God. Mm -hmm. This is what we call dogma. Having accepted that dogma, then you practice your religion. You should love your neighbor as Jesus Christ, and so love the stranger, return evil with good. Now, in the case of Abrahamic religions, the acceptance of the creed is crucial for defining membership. Or it is the key element in your membership. I'm not saying it is these religions are restricted to dogma. I'm saying that you have to accept the dogma to be considered a Christian, a Muslim, or a Jew. And then, of course, practice follows. And once you have accepted the dogma, you will be just on the level of your practice. So I'm not saying that practice is totally no. But the difference is that when we come to, especially Hinduism, Hinduism has this broad acceptance that there can be many creedal formulations. You can believe in one God, two gods, many gods, no God. And so people will say, fine, this is what you believe, but they will judge you. Not in terms of your dogma, but in terms of your practice. So this is what I meant by the relative positioning of dogma and practice. Now we have a very striking illustration of this from the life of Mahatma, Mahatma Gandhi. For a while, Mahatma Gandhi collaborated with some very prominent Muslims in a joint political campaign. At the end of this campaign, one of the Muslim leaders was asked, how do you compare Mahatma Gandhi to a Muslim? And he said, a Muslim is more acceptable to me, no matter how his lifestyle. If he's a Muslim, I love him. Then a Gandhi, no matter how pious he may be. And he was, it seems, might even seem mildly offensive to us, 
that such a statement would be made about a person like Mahatma Gandhi. But this is the correct theological position. I mean, orthodox point. This is what I meant, the difference between dogma and practice. Now, can you see more in support of this, that the concept of religious identity in India is not confined to exclusive religious identity. You can say in India, I am a Hindu, or only a Hindu, or a Buddhist, or a Jain, or a Sikh. Or a follower of Adi Dharma or tribal religions. But there are also Indians who say that I am both a Hindu and Buddhist, and or a Sikh or Jain, and vice versa. By India, I mean the Indian subcontinent, mm -hmm. including Nepal. Mm -hmm. What does it indicate? That religious identity is less important than religious behavior. You can claim to belong to one religion, two religions, nobody is offended. But if you break the basic moral rules which are shared by these religions, then you lose, lose your credibility as representing that religion. There are many similarities between Christianity and Hinduism. And you also mentioned Gandhi and Jesus. Give us some examples how they might, in one way or another, be similar. Yeah, the point, there are a couple of points at which they meet. So one of them is that when you go to the devotional forms of Hinduism, and compare them with Christianity. Then they come very close. Because even in Hinduism, when you come to the devotional literature, sometimes you might feel that I can only really be devoted to one god of these many gods of the Hindu pantheon, Shiva or Vishnu, or an incarnation of Vishnu like Ram or Krishna. That he or that God or Goddess is the sole focus of your attention. So, although in all philosophically you may not subscribe to this position, pragmatically you will be subscribing to it, which is the dogmatic position in Christianity. But you come very close. I believe in Jesus, Jesus will see me. I believe in Shiva, or Vishnu. They will see. So this is one sphere. The other is ethics. And uh, you'll be surprised that a scholar of Islam, very famous scholar called Al Biruni, some have described him as the greatest scholar in history. He wrote a book called in translation known as Al-Biruni's India. It's a survey of Indian culture. When it comes to Hindu ethics, he says that ethics is the same as that of the Christians. You turn evil with good. And when Mahatma Gandhi says that the Sermon on the Mount went straight to his heart, in the very first reading, it was this teaching. You turn evil with good. which will not get affected you. What did you enjoy most writing the book Christianity for Hindus? There are a couple of things. One which I really enjoyed in the sense of feeling that it was a very good thing to bring to the attention of the Hindu, enjoying that sense. That the way most Hindus are now encounter Christianity 
in India is in the following form that the Christian wants to convert me to his or her religion. This is the impression I had when I was growing up in India, mainly about Christianity. This is the impression Mahatma Gandhi had about Christianity in India. Maybe because India was seen as a mission field, especially during the British Empire, by many churches. And so this is the primary impression which most Indians carry about Christianity. It was therefore very interesting for me to have to point out two things. First, so this is not the whole of Christian. This is evangelical Christian. There is also liberal Christianity. After all, I went through, I spent, I went through a theological school to obtain my degree in theological history. and continued to interact with it while I was at the university. But no one ever asked me to convert to Christian. I took classes in the Bible, in church history, in the social gospel of Christians. I interacted freely with other Christians and with ministers. So here's my personal testimony that all Christianity does not have to be evangelical. There is such a thing as liberal Christianity. Perhaps we don't have enough of it in India. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe I've been moving in the wrong circles. <laughs> okay. So this was one thing. But even more important than that was to point out that when the Christian asks you to convert, although you might feel that this is a very uh, supercilious attitude, You don't have the true religion. I have the true religion. I want to have it. Without it, you'll be, you will rot in hell. With it, you'll be saved. There's a certain measure of, you can read a certain measure of condescension in this whole attitude that I'm here to convert you. But if you look at it from a Christian point of view, it could be an overflow of a more positive sentiment. That is love. If you feel that we have found the answer to life's problem in Christianity, and it works for you and for community, would you not want to share it with others? Now, this can be easily corrupted through power, self-interest, and so on. But one cannot deny that if the approach is based on the way the attitude I described, then even if you don't want to change your religion, it is not an attitude which you must naturally detest. You can politely say that I am happy with my own religion. And, and you need not follow up on that any further. So it was important to point this out that the motive for trying to convert others can be a very sincere thing. And Yannick, let me ask you, 
Suppose we are now having been discussing these issues of life, of the spiritual life, ultimate life. Suppose you and I conclude that we have arrived at the answer. We have found we have cracked the cosmic code. We know what the answer is. Do you think we'll be able to keep it to ourselves? We do not want to proclaim it. Look, we have the answer. Such a natural thing. After all, the Buddha, after he had the final insight, wanted to share it. But he made me decide to. So, there is, it is possible to, uh, or maybe I would say it is even necessary to take this perspective into account to form a balanced view of this aspect of Christian. It's very impressive how you're able to formulate this and to give uh, so many different perspectives on really the Christian way as it can be perceived very much authentic, but also is the ability that you have to actually look at a different perspective and actually see, well, you know, if you look at it this way, it can actually be a compliment. But obviously, as you said, the problem of what happens with human beings is that things get corrupted, you know. And I think that's a very interesting question too, that if you think really, or you know that you found the answer, it is kind of tricky too to go then out and actually proclaim it. So it's such a natural thing mm -hmm. to want to share it. Now we will see huh, the very interesting sequel to this, which is that when Indians started feeling that they have the answer, that all religions are. The person who formulated this in a major way went all the way to America and proclaimed it. He was not saying, mind is the only true religion, you must follow it. But he was saying, this probably is the correct attitude to have towards other religions. It is accepted. Or at least considered. So structurally, once you have a an ennobling insight, a sublime insight. Whether it is of the kind which might be considered narrow, follow my religion, or more broad based, you can follow any religion. But once you are inspired by that insight, then your behavior really displays a similar pattern. To a point, of course. What makes you feel alive? Well, I think life. The phenomenon of life is endlessly intriguing. What is all this? What are you doing here? And what responses to these questions have people come up with? In past ages, in our times, in different reasons, in the various ideology. I think it will be quite exciting. Orwin Jormo, thank you so much for your time and your insight and wisdom.
to make us somehow a little bit more white. Let's see it here. Thank you for giving this opportunity to or, ask us these questions. Or we draw you. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, I, I would like to ask you maybe, you know, we can cut this in and we can do, use this for different uh, things. I think it's very interesting if you have something. And another one. What, you know, what do you consider most important for a human being to know or discover during his or her lifetime? The most interesting thing, important thing to discover is, I think, the various answers which people have come up with me to this question. The most important thing to know is who you are. And who are you? Meaning who I am, to ask this question. Yeah. This question is regarded in mysticism as one of the great questions. Mm -hmm. That the real mystery you have to prove is your own. Is it still a mystery to you regarding to you or life? Yes. But you know, it's the kind of mystery in which uh, which is uh, not disoriented. A mystery usually has this connotation of something which might disorient you. It's too mysterious for me to study or go into and all. This is the kind of mystery which draws you in. And if you uh, were asking me as to what progress one will make or one has made in this, then I think the best example I can give is that of a sheriff who has been tasked for tracking some crime or some happening. And he has got some clues and he's working on them. And the chef can say, I don't have the answer to the mystery. But I feel I'm getting closer to solving it. <laughs> As I get these clues, try to connect. Do you consider yourself spiritual or religious? Well, it will depend on how we define these terms. But nowadays, of course, there is this very interesting category of people who call themselves spiritual, but not religious. And I think there they have a special meaning of religion in mind. Religion is an organized system. Like Christianity, Islam, you know, where you have a church or a, something which corresponds to it, you have some rules to follow, and it's all laid down. The spiritual search is more open ended. You do not know where it might lead you to. When you call yourself spiritual, you throw yourself open to that possibility. And in that case, yes, I'd call myself spiritual rather. We should not uh, undervalue the role of uh, religion, quote unquote. I have known people who have said to me that it is only after Somebody died in the film. 
and they realize that oh my God, it tells you how to move, how to be, how to get old. It has the experience of ages behind it. Or when people have special personal tragedy, they are able to deal with it because of the resources which have been provided to them by the so-called organizations. I think what oftentimes also gets missed is that it can really prepare oneself for this journey of life, especially when it comes towards death or dying. Yes. It is a great mystery. Yeah. And religion deals with mystery, the ultimate mystery of God, our life. So that is a great challenge. Uh, it provides different religions provide a framework for dealing with the unknown. So the great thing about religion is that they openly acknowledge that there is the unknown. But that one need not necessarily be afraid of. The older you get, do you feel that you experience life more and more fully and meaningfully and purposefully? Or how do you experience if you look back? Now, I know that you are already. I think personal growth consists precisely in what you are saying in able to live life more meaningfully, in a more positive way, in a wiser way. When we set such store by experience, what we are really saying that it provides us ways of connecting dots in which are more meaningful, positive, even felicitous. Then, what was have been built to us in our earlier life? What's your very first thing when you wake up in the morning that you do, that you look forward to? Just the next day. See, every day, it's almost like it's unfold. No? Certain things, of course, happen by way of routine, but there are different news items every day. You meet sometimes different people, or the same people displaying different dimensions of their personality. It's a kind of a perpetual play. Do you think that you played it so far up to now well? No, the rule we visualize ourselves as playing in. If we see ourselves as a character, then there is hardly any role for judgment. If you are given a role in a play, even of a murder, don't apply the criterion of moral judgment. That is the role you have to play. So that is what we are looking at as a participant in this journey. If you define your role to be somebody who judges, as a judge in the drama, then you pass judgments. 
So it's a kind of rule we perceive ourselves as playing. In the room. Professor Orwin Krohn, thank you so much for your time and timeless wisdom. And thanks for taking the time and making the effort to come all the way to Montreal and to uh, provide this opportunity for us to interact. That's why knowledge.